This video is about statistics. Now, don't worry, we won't be looking at a bunch of numbers. I'm no expert on statistics, but I know something about critical thinking. And statistics are sometimes presented to us as unassailable facts. When half the time someone shows you statistics, you're being conned. So let's try to see through the con. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. This video was sponsored by the new streaming service that brings all the other streaming services together, Paradis Plus. Hit like on this video to win a free 20-year subscription. Paradis Plus. Sign up today to get your kids to stop screaming. People love to invoke statistics to prove their points, and we're expected to treat them as facts. But statistics don't always say what people claim they say. And even when they do, someone still might be using them to pull the wool over our eyes. Right-wingers especially will cite a study in the knowledge that most of their listeners won't follow it up, and if you actually read the study or reports on it, it turns out what they're saying is inaccurate or misleading, maybe a total fabrication, or maybe just shoddy research conducted by a right-wing think tank whose conclusions were decided before they started writing. But anyone could use studies or statistics or history to deceive you and, for that matter, themselves. Read the studies for yourself. Do they say what they say they say? What about categories? Studies are always putting people into categories. How do they make those categories? Who's included and excluded in each category and why? I often find categories meaningless. Race, for example, only means something in the context of the culture. And it's inevitably a self-reported category, so there's not much scientific about it. Racists love trotting out statistics on race because they want you to think that category, those, those categories, matter. See? They'll select vague criteria to prove their point, too, like crime, which says nothing about the type of crime or anything else, any other context. Shit, selling lemonade without a permit is a crime. Racists with statistics want you to think some numbers related to vague criteria and assigned to people in arbitrary categories could somehow tell a story about how intelligent or violent a huge group of people are. Because they want to manipulate you. But you can't just infer causes from some numbers. People love to reduce everything to numbers and draw firm conclusions from the numbers they've chosen. Well, how did they turn things into numbers? How did they group them into categories? What variables have been omitted? How could they have done things differently? What other conclusions could be drawn? One of the most common mistakes uh, that people make is they confuse correlation with causation. In other words, just because two variables seem to go together on a chart doesn't mean one variable caused the other. Let's check out some examples on this website, Spurious Correlations. So you could see, for example, uh, U.S. government spending on science correlates very strongly, almost perfectly, with suicides by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation. Okay, it's just a correlation. There's nothing causal. It's just interesting that the lines kind of go in the same direction when you put them on a chart this way. <laughs> Number of people who drowned by falling into a pool correlates pretty well with films Nick Cage appeared in. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I mean, it's just about lines, right? And finally, per capita cheese consumption in the U.S. correlates pretty strongly with number of people who die by becoming tangled in their bedsheets. Note for interest that the numbers of people who died are in the hundreds for each of these times. Anyway, the point is, 
it can look like causation when you put those two things next to each other, but everything is correlative. I find it's always important to approach statistics critically, and, and actually people seem to do that naturally, a lot of people, when it's something we disagree with. We can always find ways to poke holes in an argument if we don't like it, or at least just kind of have a vague feeling of suspicion. It's a useful tool. But sometimes the numbers come from a really authoritative source, like a government study producing official statistics, and some people just turn their critical faculties off at that point. Now, it's not that all statistics are lies. In fact, assuming that would be another way of turning off critical thinking, or everything the government ever says is a lie. So it doesn't, doesn't make sense. Critical thinking is about delaying judgment, waiting until the evidence is clear before you take a side. It's tough nowadays for governments, depending where, to completely invent official figures without lots of people pointing it out, because they're under a lot of scrutiny and there are other agencies collecting data. That said, China's government is notoriously opaque, so it's easy for them to say they've eliminated poverty and their supporters accept their self-reported statistics as if there were no other questions worth asking. Measuring poverty means measuring a bunch of different criteria chosen and for the most part reported by the people in power. People with power do things for their own purposes. It's not that governments can't lie, but for the most part they don't need to. The simple fact that government decides what to measure and how means it's already succeeded. I'll suggest checking out this video if you want a lot more detail on the topic of poverty statistics by the channel Unlearning Economics, which I recommend. I know some economics and history and stuff, but I hate looking at charts, so I do as little of that as possible on this channel, so watch the video if you want lots more detail and analysis. In this video, I'm only offering some suggestions and questions we can use to think critically. Official statistics have a couple of uses. They can be used as propaganda, as statistics are continually revised and their criteria are continually changed. So just like employment figures, GDP, etc., politicians can pick and choose what they want to emphasize and what they want to ignore. Poverty rate going up? Ah, but unemployment is down. And that's because of our no-nonsense approach to getting people back to work after that last government screwed up the economy and created all these poor people. See how easy that is? More broadly, official statistics are about controlling the conversation. Officials decide what will be officially measured and therefore officially true. Who's to say what the state chooses to measure is what matters? All governments measure poverty differently, and they're always revising it, but not necessarily to be more accurate. Who's to say how they measure it is the right way to measure it? Why should poverty or whatever be measured by country? Who's to say their official categories are the right way to categorize people? Why do you draw these conclusions? What part of the real world do your measurements actually explain? Think about GDP. Why do we measure GDP? What does it reflect other than the very specific function it claims to measure, which is the value of everything produced within the borders of a given country? The government and the news use it as a proxy for some kind of mystical benefit that a growing economy brings to you, the worker. But no, really. What benefit does it bring you, the worker? Do you get a raise when the GDP goes up? Mm. I didn't think so. No, but I bet rent and food prices go up. Or what benefit does, say, a rise in the stock market mean to you? Do you own any of the businesses whose balance sheets have been improving? Do the poor? 
built into the idea of GDP is the assumption that the economy should grow continuously. Economic growth means producing more things, which might mean cutting down more trees or blowing up more mountaintops and almost definitely means producing a lot of waste. But who cares about all that? The economy must grow. And what happens when it doesn't grow? Disaster. When GDP doesn't grow for two straight quarters, we're in recession. <sighs> we have to fire hundreds of workers because of the recession, or at the very least, we can't give you a raise for the foreseeable future. There's a recession on, you know. Neoliberal capitalist governments use recessions to implement austerity, the gutting of whatever social welfare programs the government uses to justify its existence. All because of criteria they chose for things they want to measure, with no reference to how it affects things. So let's talk about poverty. What makes someone poor? Well, it's hard to say. <laughs> Is it relative deprivation or absolute deprivation? Is it about what you lack? Who decides what and how much humans need? But instead of answering any of those questions that you or I could easily come up with, official poverty statistics are all about lines. <laughs> the World Bank's official line for extreme poverty is a buck ninety per day. In other words, if you live on less than a dollar ninety per day, you live in extreme poverty regardless of how much money you actually need. The figure wasn't chosen totally at random, but it obviously has no relation to how much it actually costs to live, because everywhere and everyone is different. Some people need way more than that to survive. The other thing is, the World Bank compiles self-reported government statistics, which are not standardized across the board, not, not standard criteria and adjusts them for self-reported inflation statistics. So the World Bank's figures pretty much measure apples in one country and oranges in another. You know, people will say, these are the numbers, the numbers don't lie. My ass, they don't. <laughs> then you've got the US Census Bureau's poverty stats. They pretty much just estimate incomes. I couldn't find anywhere on the site that explained why income estimates were their only way of measuring poverty. They just focus on official poverty thresholds, which are minimum incomes for, for people, you know, depending on the number of people in the household, and nothing else. The website has lots of reports, but of course they all report on the same narrow criteria. It's like everything official. Lots of research is conducted, but only within very strict limits. You can find some links to some better criticism in the description. One thing people never mention when talking about poverty statistics is poor people tend to die, especially where they don't have health care. And you can't count people in poverty statistics if they're dead. It would be highly relevant to know the figures for people who've died of poverty-related causes like malnutrition, exposure, preventable diseases, overdose, and suicide, or just lack of basic hygiene and health care, and then contrast them with the number of rich people who've died of the same causes. But that might require some real research as opposed to compiling self-reported figures and applying some formula to them. It might require you to ask questions. Likewise, poverty statistics don't measure the precarity of life for billions of people above the line. If you took the, the, world, the official World Bank poverty line of $1.90 a day and revised it upwards by just a few dollars, you might find about half the world's population below the line. Again, check the links in the description. All this has been calculated. But we don't hear about that, because we don't get any context to our statistics. We just believe the graph and follow the line, however arbitrary it all is. Sure, you're struggling with unemployment, debt, 
bankruptcy, inflation, etc., but you're not officially poor, so your life must not be that bad, so you don't qualify for government assistance. No, poverty statistics tell us in so many words that most people are not poor. So people conclude the system must be working, with just with some kinks that need to be smoothed out. See, China eliminated extreme poverty. The line says so. Millions of people conclude from the media's interpretation of these reports that what we need to solve poverty is more of the same. More government intervention into people's lives, more police, more charity, more foreign aid, more integration of the poor into global markets, etc. When another possible answer would be to leave people alone and stop taking everything they have. But people with power would never do that. But see, that's why it's actually a question of philosophy. Because whether they're aware of it or not, people are informed by some philosophy. In most people's cases, it's just whatever the ruling class has drilled into them, plus, you know, whatever they still remember from when they read The Alchemist. But it's still a philosophy, a way of looking at life and the world. Philosophy informs everything we do, like the questions we ask and the conclusions we draw. The ruling ideology does not let you examine the structure of society. You're trained not to ask about the systems, the laws, the property relations, and how they entrench poverty. Inequality, insecurity, poverty, homelessness, these are all inevitable byproducts of this system. They lead to real people suffering. I think we should be talking about overarching social structures and systems of violence that affect everyone and ruin lives. Instead, we're supposed to think there's more value in turning individuals into numbers on graphs because it looks scientific, and it makes everything impersonal, so we don't care so much. If you tell me that child over there is starving, well, get them some food. If you tell me some child is a number, write another report. Part of my philosophy is to be critical of everything I hear. And that's why I've been asking these questions all through this video. One of my favorite questions is, who says? Who says that's the cause of poverty? Who says that's how you measure poverty? Who says that's how you solve it? Economists? Bureaucrats? Hollywood actors? Right-wing YouTube channels? People who attend global economic summits and eat caviar with some of the most powerful people in the world. Funny how they all agree what we need is more of the same. People want to fight poverty, but they really want to keep the rest of the system intact. Well, where do you think this poverty came from? How did they become poor? Or to ask a different question, obviously more loaded, who took everything from these people? Where are the statistics for that? How would you even begin to assign numbers to that problem? I think numbers and statistics and reports are less helpful and more of a distraction from actually empowering the poor to rise up. Statistics can help make your point, but if you're being honest, you need to acknowledge the limitations of the data you're wielding. The claim that poverty is the default state of humankind is ahistorical. It's wrong. I made a video about this already. You can check out here. Uh, again, links are all in the description. Just because we haven't had money to spend and goods to consume throughout our history does not mean we suffered from the effects of what today we call poverty. Capitalism hasn't ended poverty, and it can't. It's exacerbated it. The problem is, people confuse production and money, see, that's the GDP mindset again, with better lives for everyone. Elsewhere, I've gone into how the poor could liberate themselves, for example, here, again, description, if you want, but ultimately, Ending poverty is about empowering people to free themselves, to cast off the shackles this system has put on them. All people need 
is a clear understanding of their situation and the roots of their problems and the will to change it. Thanks.